Problem Solving Take the case of American forensic scientist Frances Glester Lee and her diorama series entitled Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death, which she painstakingly created by herself in the 1940s and 1950s and are still used today to train investigators in the science of observation and inference making. Now, consider the 1947 diorama Free Room Dwelling. A man, covered in blood, lies face down on the floor on top of covering strip from the bed beside him. A few inches away, a woman lies on the bed as if peacefully asleep, but her face and the sheets covering her are soaked in blood. In an adjacent room, a baby in a crib suffered the same horrendous fate, bloody while cradled by blankets. A teddy bear lies next to an overturned chair. The rest of the house, when lived in and stocked with food, supplies, and appliances, neatly sewed away with some things amiss, as is typical in a usual middle-class home, are left undisturbed. We ask, who are these people? How are they related? How did they die? Why did they die? And why in such horrible ways? Most importantly, who killed them? Our preoccupation with murder mysteries is reflected in the great number of detective thriller comics, animated and live-action TV shows and films, board and video games, blogs, and web series that have gained popularity across the years. It's always the same theme as Glessner released dioramas. Use a crime scene, solve the crime. Identify the motive, figure out the means, capture the culprit, reconstruct the narrative, and justice rule the day. Come to think of it, it's not the mystery itself that so immerses us, but the excitement of putting things together, by considering the evidence, setting apart the plausible and implausible, and coming up with a satisfying and reasonable explanation. Out of chaos, to being order, from a certainty you see clarity. That's why understanding the workings of human cognition, including how we solve problems, is very important. They are equivalent to motives and needs. They show us the processes, directions, and biases that guide how we take in information and we arrange them to solve the problems that confront us. The only difference is that while forensic scientists use explanations and assumptions to speak for the dead, they take psychological principles to give justice to the experiences of the living. Problems differ based on how much information they provide and how much knowledge they assume we have. We encounter a lot of problems every day, ranging from the daily inconveniences of missed alarms and cold shower water in equally cold weather, to the more substantial traffic jams and requirement backlogs, to the seemingly insurmountable ills of corruption and democratic backsliding. Though they span such disparate levels of individual and societal concerns, all problems share the characteristic that they are obstacles which prevent us from achieving a goal. Also, the solution is not always obvious and the obstacle is not always easy to bypass, otherwise we won't have a problem in the first place. Because of this, problem solving involves recognizing that there's indeed a problem, and so you engage in purposeful, goal-directed, and typically controlled cognitive processing to arrive at a solution, which resolves how you can overcome the obstacles facing you. With the many things we do and face in life, it makes sense that problems also come in many forms. Based on level of specification or how much information is available to you, problems can be well defined, where you have clear details about your current problematic state, what possible strategies you can take, what goal you're aiming for, and what solutions would best resolve your problem, or ill-defined, where you lack information about where you are, where you're going, and what you should do. Math problems, balancing chemical reactions, and planning which routes to take for your road trip are well defined because you have a good idea of what problems will arise and it's clear what strategies, whether simplification, distributing electrical charges, or using a navigation app would help you out. Meanwhile, deviations from research plans, fixing a rocky relationship, and starting a new phase of your life involve a lot of uncertainties that aren't clear at the outset. Problems also differ based on how much knowledge or expertise is required to solve the problem. Knowledge-rich problems, like the word problems you encounter in class, require some level of practice or specialized knowledge to be solved, 
because of the situation assumes that you're bringing in background information which can help you figure things out. Unless you're familiar with chemical reactions and mathematical expressions, those word problems won't make sense for you. Meanwhile, knowledge lean problems like riddles and puzzles can be solved by anyone either because they rely on knowledge that most people would typically have or because the problem has all the information you need to come up with a solution. Sudoku, the Rubik's Cube, wire puzzles, and games in general do have rules, but they're typically easy to pick up or quite obvious enough, like in Hangman or Tic Tac Toe, but anyone can reasonably solve them, minimal expertise required. Either way, it's clear that problems rely on how we take in information, how we interpret them, and if needed, how we use our knowledge and experiences to fill in the blanks, so we can come up with solutions that get us from the initial problem to our desired goal state. Problems can be solved either by looking at it from another point of view or by taking it apart completely. Problem solving is all about taking the information and knowledge that we have to see how they can be taken apart and put together to help us overcome the obstacles that we face. We're going to look at two approaches which explain exactly how we get from the problem to the solution. The Gestalt approach, yes, the same folks who talk about Gestalt principles of organization, believe that we could solve problems by looking at it from another perspective. That is, they focus on problem representation, how we organize the information available in a problem situation, and how our cognitive dispositions can either help or hinder how we can come up with solutions. So, we solve problems through productive thinking, which involves looking at things and taking in information through more ways than one. Remember that Gestalt psychology was reacting against the tile and error approach that behaviorism advocated, which says that learning and solving are done step by step with reproductive thinking, relying entirely on what information and experiences are available. The Gestaltists were thinking outside the box, literally, when they argued for insight. They said that sometimes we don't solve problems using an analytically based procedure by following an algorithm that leads us down clearly specified steps. Of course, these steps would lead to the right solution when applied correctly, such as when you do the order of operations in mathematics, assign the IUPAC name to an organic compound, or troubleshoot common problems on your computer. At the same time, the number of steps tell you how far away you are from solving the problem and reaching your goal. The problem is that this level of detailed problem solving is time-consuming and is only effective when we have a clear set of steps that can be used in a situation. Insight is quite the opposite. You arrive at a solution seemingly out of nowhere due to the sudden realization of how the parts of the problem can be reorganized in novel and unobvious ways. Still, you sometimes need time for incubation or letting your brain's default mode network, which is responsible for background processing and mind wandering, to run the problem outside your immediate consciousness and search your memories for relevant information or experiences. That's why it's easier to escape the tip of the tongue, remember a vague memory, or come up with a better solution when you're not actively thinking about it. However, insight is not systematic and not always applicable, so we wouldn't always be successful in solving problems through sudden realization. To demonstrate the merits and limits of insight, let's look at the classic candle task. In this problem, you're given a candle, some matches, and a box of thumbtacks. Your task is to stick the candle onto a corkboard using only the things given to you. What makes insight quite hard to get in these types of problems is fixation, our tendency to focus too much on some aspect of the problem, which then prevents us from looking at things with fresh eyes. Because your job is to attach the candle to the board, you might think that you just have to thumbtack the candle. Problem solved. But this is a mental set. You remember the fact that thumbtacks pierce objects to attach them to something else, as you've successfully done in the past, so you fixate on this stacking property while failing to recognize that candles are too brittle to survive a thumbtack. Indeed, the candle fell to the ground in more pieces than when you started. A good solution would have been for you to empty the thumbtack box, then tack the box onto the board, then stick the candle on top of the tack box using melted wax, problem actually solved. But this solution relies on your ability to bypass functional fixedness of realizing that the thumbtack box is not just a container for tacks, but can also be used, in this case, as a platform to hold objects. Our second perspective, the information processing approach, also believes that how we organize a problem in our heads by searching for relevant knowledge and experiences 
can help us reach a solution. This approach is largely based on Alan Newell and Herb Simon's work on the general problem solver. If you remember, they were some of the scientists figuring out how to replicate human cognition in AI research. In this perspective, the problem is defined in terms of the problem space, which is the abstract representation of what situation you're in and what actions you can take. This contains your initial state, the problem itself, intermediate states, what happens after you do anything, the goal state, the solution you want to achieve, and operators, the steps you take to try to solve the problem, which take you from state to state. We also use a few strategies to check if we're on the right track to a solution. Through progress monitoring, we see how fast we're able to reach our goal, either by counting the steps or how much time it took us to solve the problem. If we feel that we're going too slow, we can declare criterion failure and decide to use another strategy which we think will be more effective. Unfortunately, because progress monitoring is a heuristic, we can give up on a solution prematurely when in fact it's the right thing to do just that it takes time to reach the end. Another strategy, means and analysis, is also a heuristic that gives us a general idea of how large a discrepancy exists between our current and goal states. Sometimes, this distance is so large that we can create intermediate states called subgoals, which divide that large gap into more manageable pieces. The problem is that sometimes we need to make subgoals that temporarily increase the distance between our current and goal states, and we can misjudge this as a failure of what solution we're using. Ultimately, subgoals typically give us the most effective solutions because they give us advantages in efficiency later on in the problem solving process. To make these terms clear, let's consider our real life problem, navigating from point A to point B. Whether to go out with friends, visit a relative, attend school, or a work meeting, we need to take a private vehicle or public transportation to get from one place to another. The problem space is then figuring out the most efficient route in terms of costs, whether transportation fares or gas consumed, and speed, whichever route will let you get there the fastest. Your initial state is where you're coming from, your place of residence, another appointment, whichever, and your goal state is your destination. Your intermediate states are all the routes and changes of directions you could take, or your operators are any decisions you make to redirect yourself. With the problem clear, let's get on the road. Let's assume that the vehicle you're riding will not stall or break down, and the only problem will be traffic. An ideal world, I know. You reach a major intersection, and now you've been stuck in traffic for 20 minutes. What do you do? Means and analysis would say that you should look for another route, and progress monitoring would tell you that you should find a way to at least get closer to your destination, whichever path is fastest. Indeed, some divers would rapidly shift lanes when traffic clears that part, or go into a side road only to merge with the same traffic jam down the line. Both are sub goals about bypassing that section of traffic, but the solutions are useless because they're going down the same road, so you just wasted time and resources traveling down shortcuts that don't get you far ahead. A better sub goal would be to research alternative routes that entirely avoid that stretch of traffic, such that you will end up somewhere else that has clearer roads. If all else fails and no other route is available, Keeping to the same road and lane, except when traffic is actually due to roadblocks or incidents, is the best solution because shifting lanes and going down shortcuts only give a semblance of getting you closer to your destination, when in fact you just added travel time because you're bored of waiting. One last thing to note is that problems, even when they have similar solutions, can become difficult to solve because of how they are represented or worded. In a Gestalt Kendall task, people were less likely to think of a thumbtack box as a platform when the objects were introduced as candle, matches, and tacks, than when a box of thumbtacks was explicitly mentioned. This means that encouraging people to reconsider their mental sets and preconceptions could help improve creative problem solving. As we'll see in the next section, problem representations are crucial in helping us understand transfer and analogical problem solving. People differ in their abilities to solve problems because of how much knowledge they bring into the situation. People bring in their knowledge, expectations, expertise, creativity, and other individual differences when faced with a problem. So, these differences can then influence how easily people can come up with solutions. The only question is then whether these background influences are beneficial or harmful to successful problem solving, which we call transfer. The success of transfer, of using knowledge in solving a previous problem to the task at hand, depends on task similarity, 
have alike the two problems are based on their general characteristics, structure, and processes involved, context similarity, whether the new problem is similar in physical and social circumstances, and time interval, how long ago the first problem was solved. When the original and the current problem are similar on these dimensions, we call it near transfer because it's a bit easier to see how the two situations overlap. However, we can also have far transfer where the current task is not obviously similar to the original one. Indeed, near or far, transfer can be positive where previous knowledge helps us solve the problem, or negative like in fixation and mental sets where our experiences prevent us from arriving at a good solution. Going back to problem representations can help us make sense of these terms. One classic problem using the information processing approach involves a regular 8x8 chessboard and dominoes. What happens is that two opposite corners of a chessboard were removed, leaving you with 62 squares. The question is whether you could cover those remaining 62 spaces completely with dominoes, with each half of the domino covering one square. In a heartbeat, you think that dominoes have two faces and you have 62 board spaces, so yes, it is possible. Actually, it's not. By removing opposite corners, you've taken away two black or two white squares. Remember that chessboard squares alternate in color, so a domino must cover a black and an adjacent white square. The 62 squares you have left are 32 of one color and just 30 of the other. At most, you can maybe cover 60 squares with two in excess. The answer is that the task is impossible. Why isn't it obvious? Because the problem is abstract and involves a lot of side reasoning. However, we can help people solve this problem faster by representing it as an analogy, noting connections to a simpler and more intuitive situation. Through analogical encoding, people compare whether the analogy, the clear resource problem, and the task at hand, the more complex target problem, are similar enough in structure and solution. If it is, then they can engage in analogical transfer, figuring out how the analogical situation can be applied to the more difficult task. We call this process analogical problem solving, the sequence of noticing similarities, mapping the source onto the target, and applying an adapted solution. So, to help people answer the chessboard problem, some were also given an analogical matchmaker problem. In a speed dating party, a matchmaker must pair up 32 red shirt dates with 32 blue shirt dates. Before the speed dating session, party goers were allowed to mingle with each other, drinks and food ever plenty. But just before the dating began, two redshirt attendees fell asleep on the couch, completely inebriated and passed out drunk. Because of the dating rules, the attendees may only be paired with a person wearing an opposite colored shirt. Can the matchmaker pair everyone with someone else? It's easier to say no here. The dates must be paired one red to one blue, so you can only make 30 intercolor pairs with two blue shirts lonely in some corner of the bar. The chessboard and matchmaker problems demonstrate near transfer in terms of solution, but their contexts are somewhat far from each other. They involve different people and things, different details, but the same process. Stepping away the chess squares, dominoes, shirts, and dating, both problems are just about pairing two things from two categories. The nominal pairs black and white, the matchmaker blue and red, but removing two of the same color while being restricted to opposite color pairing would always leave two behind. Hopefully, by mapping the squares on the dates and the dominoes onto the matchmaker, transfer and analogical problem solving can make the chessboard puzzle easier to understand. Of course, beyond comparing problems and looking for similarities between them, we also use information nowhere in the problem situation to help us with our tasks. We refer to these personal experiences as expertise, how our extensive efforts to learn, practice, and apply our knowledge and skills enable us to become more efficient and successful in solving problems within a given domain. Mathematicians, researchers, chess players, gymnasts, mechanics, anyone really in any profession or area of human activity, exert a lot of effort and spend a lot of time to learn more about their field or craft, make mistakes both large and small along the way, and learn from their experiences so they'll know what to do if those problems ever emerge again. These experts demonstrate routine expertise, the type of knowledge gained through experience and familiarity, which then allow them to solve problems faster. Because of this, experts outperform novices who have fewer experiences in the field by using their more expansive knowledge base to organize problems more effectively, for example, being more accurate in seeing which solution stands for across problems, and take a bit more time to analyze a task before attempting to solve it. This trend is demonstrated in the Dunning-Kruger effect, 
where amateurs and novices overestimate their ability to do a complex task while also being overconfident despite having little relevant knowledge or skills that would actually ensure their success. Meanwhile, experts tend to be more aware of their limitations and so they organize and analyze the problem first to maximize their ability to arrive at an appropriate solution. However, experts have limits too. Expertise is limited to the domain where a person has extensive knowledge and skills, so it doesn't generalize to other domains. Doctors are experts on health, accountants on auditing and procurement, lawmakers on policies, epidemiologists on disease transmission, the police on citizen defense, and academicians on analyzing the effectiveness of responses to issues of health and security. But when the wrong people are placed in charge, their domain-specific knowledge would have little bearing on their ability to decide while sitting in the position for which they have those skills. At the same time, because of fuzzy faces, experts learn how to partition problems into which details are most important while discarding everything else. Similar to expert-induced amnesia in memory, we're able to arrive at good solutions with little effort but lose the ability to explain how they arrive at an answer and sometimes can even oversimplify a problem to fit how we solved similar tasks before. So, experts can sometimes be in too deep into their knowledge but they fail to consider alternative answers and perspectives like the fixations and mental sets the Gestalt psychologists warn about. To address these issues, experts also need adaptive expertise, the ability to keep their knowledge flexible enough so it can be useful to deal with novel problems. So, even experts continue on learning and honing their skills in their field because there's always a world of possibilities with new things to explore every day. With that, it's important to say that we can all be experts by engaging in deliberate practice. We can acquire new skills and increase our knowledge of any domain of interest as long as we set more challenging goals after mastering current tasks, getting constructive feedback on our performance, and having opportunities to tie out our skills while also correcting what we're doing wrong. The important thing is growth and striving to be better. Taking a look at what we've been talking about so far, we'll notice that problem solving does not always lead to just one solution. In real life, the tasks and challenges we encounter could be overcome by taking their parts into pieces and putting them together in new ways, which we call creativity. It manifests in two ways. Some problems rely on convergent thinking, where tasks can be solved using one algorithm, which, when applied and followed correctly, will always arrive at the same correct answer. That's your math problems and chemistry reactions. You may not think of them as creative enough, but the inventiveness actually comes in when we look at the problem for the first time and try to figure out which process would work best. Meanwhile, problems like the Kendall task are more open-ended, so they allow for divergent thinking where many solutions are possible. We then see creativity in what novel and unusual solutions people offer, especially to solve the dynamic and ever-changing problems of everyday life. Francis Glass released dioramas demonstrate the creativity of divergent thinking. There are many ways to solve the crime, but the important thing is that the process is equally elegant and relevant as a solution. And this reflects what problem solving is all about. We take information from the problem or task confronting us, we search our memories for relevant knowledge and experiences, we take our skills into the current context, and we start testing out solutions until we find the one that is most appropriate for the situation. We can add style points for the best execution. Problem solving is tightly connected to our memories, which serve as the container of everything we remember, know, and are able to do. We then take this vast expanse of memories to make sense of the situations confronting us and look for the best and maybe stylish solution to move from the problem and reach the goal we're aiming for. Regardless of what means we use or what tasks we encounter, problem solving follows roughly the same sequence. Identify the problem, gather more information, clarify what you're facing, develop ideas on what to do, weigh your options, plan how to carry the solution out, actually doing things, and seeing where it takes you. There's always a risk of failure, but developing expertise allows you to judge how far you'll fall and what you can do to prevent that. Unfortunately, it also tells you what would be best for you to do. All you have left is the choice of which option to take. And that is the focus of our next episode the beauty and biases of our judgment, reasoning, and decision-making processes. See you then!